name's Jenny Ann Chondo, and I'm just here as your moderator and host for the main event and really to kind of set the stage for everybody. So let me tell you about the lady of the hour. You actually, uh, if you were with us last year, you may be familiar with Nancy Alvarez. The focus today, and I know this is going to be a beneficial one, because consistently on these Thursday sessions, we hear questions about the SBA. People are saying, I've got an SBA question and the person isn't necessarily an SBA expert. So guess what? We went and got one. We went and got an SBA expert. So we're talking about resources to starting and growing a business with SBAs. So here's the deal with Nancy Alvarez. She uh, actually works with the Small Business Administration. So yes, this is up her alley. She works in the Business Development Program. She's the Women's Business Representative in the Fort Worth District Office. So we're talking about that specifically, but I know that many of you are watching from all over the country, and so she'll have relevant information for you as well. Um, she has served there since 2011. Been. Um, she's also instrumental in providing leadership, management, and oversight to optimize the deployment of the SBA's federal contracting programs to small business communities. Uh, and that's in English and in Spanish. So that's important to note about her background as well. She has really, throughout her career, been a champion for women and disadvantaged businesses in the federal marketplace. Um, so what she does in this role is basically increased participation of small businesses in federal contracting programs, and then advocate strongly for the inclusion and participation of small business in government procurement. So we've we've touched on those items over the last couple of weeks, and now she's going to help to narrow the focus here. Um, she graduated from Jacksonville University with a bachelor's degree in business administration. She's also a member of the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society. She has been honored in so many different ways in the business community. And currently, she's an advisory board member of the Dallas-Fort Worth Federal Agency Small Business Advocacy Council. So I could say so much more, but I don't want to take away from Nancy's time because she's going to take us all the way through here get your notes ready get get ready to be focused and listen in and again if any questions come up pop them in the chat i'll be taking notes as well and i'll answer them at the end all right nancy we are ready for you okay we got a lot to cover again thank you so much for having me it's a pleasure being here being able to share with you some information let's start first by talking a little bit about sba and in a nutshell sba helps small businesses start grow expand and recover uh, most of our programs are going to fall under one of those four categories. So we are going to dive deeper into the area of government contracting. But please know that there's so much information. Um, you can visit our website to learn more about our uh, access to capital, our, about our business development assistance, um, a, our exporting program. There is so much information. I encourage you to visit our website. So let's jump um, right into our course objective here. We're going to cover a little bit about the federal marketplace landscape. Um, if you have never thought about or if it probably had some thought about maybe doing business with the federal government, we're going to explore a little bit about that. We're going to talk about suitability, um, what it is and how do you determine that. And then we're going to help you grow your business. We're going to give you some tips on how you can grow your business using um, government set aside programs. We're going to look at what the government buys, okay, in terms of products and services. We'll then look at identifying the federal market opportunities and how to market your business. We'll look at prime and subcontracting opportunities. And lastly, we'll tell you about how the government can help you. Okay, so looking at the landscape, okay, first and foremost, the federal government is the largest buyer of goods and services, and it has set aside programs where small businesses can participate without the need to be um, competing with large businesses. So there are socioeconomic groups. We're going to talk about that and how those set asides work and how you can take advantage of that. And furthermore, if later on you're interested in exploring that and you want to look more into doing business with the federal government, then you can visit our website at sba.gov forward slash the word contracting. Okay, so let's start with our social uh, economic, socioeconomic uh, categories. And um, the set-asides are 
contracts reserved specifically for small businesses. 23% is reserved automatically for small businesses. Um, there is also a uh, procurement goal of 5% for women, 5% uh, for small disadvantaged businesses, a 3% for hub zone, and 3% for service disabled veteran owned small businesses. Those are our main categories. It's interesting that um, to note here that the reservation again of these contracts for these different social economic group is driven by the law okay so we're going to talk a little bit more about that but let's show you what the sba and the government in general has been able to accomplish so the graph on gray the bars in gray represent how much dollars are set aside or reserved for small business the blue only shows you what small or the blue line shows you what the uh small businesses have been able to perform so it's interesting to note if you're looking at this market the market potential which is what i'm trying to highlight here the government has exceeded the 23 percent goal only in two years in 2015 and in 2019. so in terms of the market there's a lot of opportunities the blue will represent how much contracting dollars were awarded. And notice that we're talking about billions of dollars. So again, just to highlight some of our accomplishments, um, the federal government, the government-wide goal has been exceeded for eight years consecutively. That's a major development. We have awarded a record-breaking $145.7 billion in contracting dollars to small businesses. Again, let me emphasize as prime, we're not talking about any kind of subcontracting goals. We're talking specifically about small business as prime contractors. 26.01% was achieved of all small business eligible dollars. That means 26% were awarded strictly to small business in our um, last year in 2020. Also, over 69,000 uh, 69, small business prime contractors received the award, and those award averaged $2.1 million, okay, per contractor. So that's a lot of money. Lastly, here's some very good uh, points. We're not just only awarding the small businesses, we're working to, uh, through other social disadvantage groups. Um, and so we've been able to achieve a 10.54%, or that's equivalent for $59 billion to small businesses in the social disadvantage uh, category. Uh, as far as the service disabled veteran owned small businesses, we're proud to say that we achieved a 4.28% goal. That's equivalent to $23.9 billion. And then the federal government has exceeded its goal again, uh, in eight consecutive years. And this is the highest year that we've awarded contracts to service disabled veteran owned. Our 3% goal, we were able to exceed, which is awesome. For women, we achieved the 4.85. So if you're women owned, please note that the goal is 5%. We, we want you guys to be able to take advantage of government contracting opportunities to increase or grow your business. And lastly, the hub zone, we achieved the 2.44 uh, equal, uh, equal to $13.6 billion. So let's go, if you're interested in understanding what you need to do, to uh, get into federal contracting, the first thing is that you need to determine whether or not you're a small business. And size is determined based on either revenues or number of employees. So it's gonna be dependent on your North American Industrial Classification Code, better known as NAICS code. Each NAICS code designates whether it's a revenue-based code or an employee base. If it is, if you're in a revenue-based code, then you, you need to look at your um, uh, gross receipts over the past five years, and you average those last five years. It should not exceed that uh, number, that revenue size uh, in the SBA size table. Um, I didn't want to use an example because there's so many codes, but you can look at just type Google SBA um, size standards and it will give you the table. And all you have to do is enter your NAICS code or look for your NAICS code and it'll tell you the corresponding size. Um, so again, 
Um, you have to be small according to the size standard. If it's based on number of employees, then you're going to average out your number of employees over 12 months, and it should be uh, below the what the table indicates would be your size. Um, you must be located in order to qualify, and beside being small, you must pri your primary your primary operations must must not be outside the United States. They should be here. You should contribute to the U.S. economy. Okay, and if you're a non for profit, then you do not qualify for government contracts set aside for small business. But you can certainly look uh, look out for grant opportunities. So. Again, different programs. Really quickly, again, the NAICS here just emphasizes based on two things. So just make sure that you do meet the size standard. And if you're not sure what your code is, just visit the Census Bureau website. Um, use a uh, search word. Um, it's, if you're a mechanic, type mechanical shops or something like that, it'll give you a different code. And you can use that code till you eventually select the corresponding code. Also, NAICS codes are used in your tax returns. So if you're not sure what your code is, you might want to look at your tax returns. It will identify there what your NAICS code is. One note, important, just make sure that it is the corresponding. We have a lot of people that try to apply for, let's say, the 8A Business Development Program, and they didn't realize that their accountant selected the wrong NAICS code. So you want to make sure that you always have the right corresponding North American Industrial Classification Code. All right, another thing that you need to make sure is that you have the financial capacity to perform on contracts. Uh, and so just as you would apply for, a, let's say, an SBA loan, where we're going to look at character, cash flow, collateral, capitalization, and conditions in government contracting, you want to make sure that you have the financial capacity to perform on a contract. So look at it from the perspective of applying for a loan, because you know, when the contracting officer evaluates your financial condition, they're going to be looking at all these aspects of your financial capacity. Another way to look at it is uh, look at the largest contract that you have performed. And if you have to perform that contract for the federal government, starting off, if you can capitalize, if you can support that contract, let's say for two months before you get paid from the government, uh, from the government, that would probably give you a good indication um, what kind of contracts you can pursue in terms of dollar range. And we're using a two month cushion here um, because usually when people come into government contracting, there's a learning curve. Um, there's some paperwork that you need to learn how to process. Uh, you need to know how to invoice the government, how to communicate with the government. And so there might be times when it might take the government a month or a month and a half or two to get you paid. But once you understand, then pretty much you usually get paid in two weeks unless there's um, issues uh, that come up and the contracting officer will certainly discuss that, but certainly it's a great opportunity for you to grow your business. SBA also has loan programs for contracting. So if you're interested in that, please check out our website under financing for more information on that program. Um, you want to know also if you're, uh, once you're trying to determine whether or not you want to do business with the government, you want to find out if the government buys what you sell, right? You don't want to jump into getting certified without understanding the market and understanding in what quantities potentially. And we're going to cover some of this, okay? You also want to know um, if you have a federal contracting experience, past performance. If you do not have federal contracting experience, I always recommend, hey, pursue some subcontracting opportunities. And we have an excellent subcontracting program um, so that you get some experience under your belt. The government will also look at your private experience. So it's always a good idea to share that uh, primarily when you're submitting a proposal. Um, you want to make sure that you're capable of fulfilling the requirements, um, the, the requirements in that contract. You do not want to end up uh, defaulting because um, you didn't understand the, the solicitation and when you responded, you weren't sure. So you want to make sure all those questions that you might have beforehand before submitting that proposal and accepting that contract that, you know, you iron that out. 
Um, you want to know also where to find the opportunities. And I'm going to give you a handout. I've shared that with um, uh, Bob here, who is our support person in the background, uh, and he will be able to share that with you. And I think they're going to make a recording of this that they'll make available to you. So all that information will be available for you, but we're going to cover some of it. So understanding how the government buys is so important. Number one, I'm going to reiterate that the government, the federal government is the largest buyer of goods and services. Um, they buy about an excess of $600 billion a year. And again, it's interesting to note that 23% is reserved just for those companies that are small business. So how does the government award contracts? It awards it in three different ways. You can do a full and open competition, meaning anyone can compete. They can do a small business set aside or they can do sole source. And just to further explain, with when you have full and open, full and open means any responsible business whether it's small or large. So in this area, you would be competing with large businesses. If you do not want to compete with large business, and I don't know what small business would want to compete with a large business, then you get yourself certified and you pursue the small business set aside. And a, from a contracting officer's perspective, the contracting officer is looking at whether or not there are at least two responsible small businesses capable of performing at a fair and reasonable price. So those are that. The other thing to note is that if you're a small business, you can sub out a large portion of that contract. Um, so that's what we call the subcontracting limitation. You have to make sure that as a small business, you are performing a percentage of that contract. And those performance percentages are outlined in the Code of Federal Regulation. If you needed more information on that, I'll be more than happy to give you the reference or give you what the percentages are. And lastly, we have a sole source. And a sole source can be awarded under certain circumstances, for example. There's only one firm that can provide that particular requirement. That's one condition um, that it's compelling urgent to the federal government that they award it to you. OK, um, that there is an international agreement. If there's an international agreement, then they can award to the small business on a sole source basis. Also, if it's a national security or a public interest to the federal government, Again, they can award on a sole source basis. Also, if it's authorized or required by law, that's another reason to award as a sole source. And lastly, it can be allowed, uh, the federal government is allowed to sole source contracts to social economic companies, um, primarily like those in the 8A program. So that is a uh, a sweet deal here, how our, our 8A contractors are able to uh, grow their small businesses through, you know, these set-asides, which they don't have to compete. They're sole source. They're just awarded to them because they market it effectively. All right. So methods of contracting. And I'm not going to go too, too, in too detail into this, but I do want you to understand that there are different levels of, of buying in the federal government. And it's important for you because oftentimes I find smaller business that, that are trying to get their foot on the door and they're looking for the smaller opportunities, let's say under um, $100,000. And so they'll go and get certified and they go to the main website and SAM to look for those opportunities and they never can find it. Well, that's because the, the uh, SAM will only list opportunities in excess of $25,000 or excuse me, Yes, in excess of $25,000, but they're mostly uh, contract negotiations or sealed bid. So if you have a smaller business that's looking for the simplified acquisition, then it's it, it, they, they want to know that, okay, the dollar range that I'm looking for simplified acquisition, where do I find those simplified acquisition? Some of them can be found in the SAM, but most of them are going to be found in the uh, agency's website. If it's a micro purchase, right? Smaller purchases, uh, something that you can provide the government less than um, the micro threshold just went up to $10,000. First of all, you're going to need a credit card. 
And second, you can only find those opportunities directly on the website with the agency. So you'll either need to contact the agency and ask them to add them to their distribution list or their mailing list, or to give you access to wherever it is that they're posting it. Any SIL bidding is used when the government has a need for services and supply that is clear, specific, and complete. So there's no negotiations. You submit a price for what the government is looking for. And lastly, these contract by negotiations, these you're gonna find, these are contracts over $150,000, and you're gonna find those opportunities in the SAM system. When you do, you're going to find, you're going to read your solicitation and you will respond. And there's an opportunity because most of these contracts are technical in nature. Um, there might be the need for further negotiations. So it's not that you provide a price. There are going to be some where you can, but there are others where you're going to have to negotiate because it's technical in nature and you're going to have some questions or you're going to have to bring some highlights or some points up to the agency that they're going to have to take into consideration. Um, and things of that nature. So that's important for you to understand. I just wanted to briefly touch on that. The other thing too is the type of contracts. Again, I'm not gonna go into detail because this could be a full eight hour class, but I want you to understand that when you're reading the solicitation, you're gonna see the type of contract. If you need more information on understanding what this entails, okay, then reach out to the SBA or to one of our resource partners that will explain. But these different contracts and the terminology here is, is, is important for you to understand. Uh, and it's not major, but it, it's, it's useful for you to understand what it is that you're signing up for. Uh, for example, in an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, the word explains it. It's indefinite delivery. Um, there's not a determined amount of quantities or uh, delivery. So they're going to set that as the need arises. So again, um, some terminology here that's important for you to understand, but I'm just pointing a few things. Uh, this is also disclosed in the federal acquisition regulation, which you have access to if you go online and you Google federal acquisition regulation. Let's talk about these two here. These are a basic order agreement. They're not a contract. Um, they're used to expedite contracting for uncertain requirements. So if the government is not sure, they open up what they call this basic order agreement and they're able to issue these basic order agreements when they're uncertain of the requirements. Then they have the uh, blanket purchase agreement. And this is a method of filling uh, anticipated repetitive needs for supplies or services. So again, if you are in the business of supplying goods and services, maybe you might want to pursue a blanket purchase agreement. Okay, now, very important. How do I market to the federal government and then how do I find the opportunities? First and foremost, you need to know the agency and what they're buying, right? You don't wanna take a shotgun approach to federal contracting. What you wanna do is use the resources that I get, I'm, I'm giving you in the pamphlet called Small Business Resources um, and go at what's after the um, database where the government posts all the awards that they make. There you're gonna use your NAICS code to search what agencies buy, and it's gonna give you the top 10 agencies buying your products and services, okay? So it's a very good tool, it's free. You don't have to register for it, but if you register, then you can generate ACOT reports, which is really good. Then you wanna, as a small business, you wanna find a niche, okay? Competition can be fierce in the federal government. So if you find a niche, Number one, utilize your status as a small business if you are also participating in any of the other social uh, economic uh, categories, uh, then find out how the agency is scoring in terms of meeting their small business goals for your social category and use that too. The key here again is with all this information, you can find a niche in the federal government. Then you need to understand areas of government spending. When you do this market research in the federal procurement database system, you'll be able to determine where's the need. Sometimes as a small business, you might be 
uh, centered on one product or service, but there's an uh, opportunity for you to expand. So look at the opportunity, see what the government is buying uh, and see if you can uh, try to pursue uh, doing business with the government and pursue opportunities within that you know, area. Uh, of government spending. And lastly, you want to know your competition. And you can find that information when you're looking for these opportunities because it won't not only give you what agencies are buying what, but it also gives you who these agencies are awarding to. And that's very important and useful information. And then do your market research on your competition so that you can position yourself better. Okay, these are different level individuals that you are going to encounter. It's important for you to understand your customer. Not every one of these single people that you're going to encounter will be able to make a decision in this process of buying, right? There's influencers, uh, potentially uh, contracting officer, small business specialists, um, uh, again, experts in, in the field, if it's a technical product that are going to be providing feedback to that individual buying. The small business specialist, again, her job is to be advocate for small business and to help them reserve it to small business. Then you're going to have an SBA point of contact that you can uh, call on if you need assistance. Um, we also encourage the agencies to reserve opportunities for small business. Where you want to connect is with the buyer. OK, you never usually get to the end user, um, but if you get to the buyer, you have better opportunities to actually land the federal contract. The buyer is that person doing the connection or doing the buying for the end user, and certainly the end user is going to use the product. So, um, again, end users and buyers, but here making the determination, the buyer, but key people that you want to make sure that you can connect in this whole process. All right. Ingredients to making a favorable impression. We all know how important it is to, uh, you know, first, first, uh, first impressions. So make sure that you can make a favorable first impression. Impression. And here are some helpful tips on how you can accomplish that. Be familiar with the agency you're targeting. Understand what they. Every single website for the federal government has a section that talks about them, about us. Um, when they started, what they were all about, what their products are, what their mission is, their vision. Make sure that you understand that because in the whole big picture, you're trying to, when you're marketing yourself to the agency, you're trying to help them understand how you fit in their picture of accomplishing their mission. Be prepared to deliver an elevator speech. Make sure that it's no longer than 15 minutes, but you want to make sure that it's effective. Again, you can meet with any of our resource partners that can help you how to prepare an elevator speech uh, and help you make sure that it is going to be an effective elevator speech. Prepare a business card with your certifications. If you have a business card and your business card is blank in the back, then you're not maximizing your business card. Make sure that you include your certifications. If you're women owned, if you're 8A, whatever certification you have, uh, if you can also include your NAICS codes in the back, that would be a great idea. Um, because usually contracting officers use this specifically when they're looking for a small business. And lastly, and this one is so important, have a capability statement that includes your NAICS code. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about capability statement. What is a capability statement? Well, a capability statement uh, establishes a purpose, right? Proof of qualifications, what you're capable of achieving, a little information uh, on your company. It's for, it, it works as an introduction, introducing your company. It's also a great marketing tool to open doors and uh, captivate your audience because it's going to have some key information, which I'm going to highlight in our next slide. Um, what is it? Consider it a business resume, but basically this document speaks as to your company. It also helps you build relationships. So again, it's a great marketing tool. How do you use it? You can use it with your prime or teaming opportunities. So if you wanna be a prime to the federal government, this is the document that the government is going to ask for. Um, if you're also looking for a, another small business to team up or to do a joint venture, use it with them so that they understand what you bring to the table. 
Um, if you're going to pursue um, sources sought, and sources sought are announcements that the government will publish to find out interested small business so that they can determine whether they're going to reserve it for women owned, small business, service disabled, veteran owned, et cetera, et cetera. They do sources sought. It's not a contract. It's just they're trying to find out how many small businesses and what type of socioeconomic groups are interested so that they can reserve it. But you can use it to respond to the sources sought or request for information, uh, which are also posted on the system, uh, SAM, System for Award Management, SAM. All right, core elements of a capability statement. Um, number one, it should have your company name or logo. It should clearly identify that it's a capability statement. I always tell people go to Google and Google capability statement and you click on images and you're going to see um, some images of some examples of capability statements. Uh, and certainly you can draw some very helpful tips from some of the ones you're going to see in Google because I see some very good ones. Um, also, you're going to include um, other branding elements. It's important for you to put your corporate data, um, office locations. If you're located in more than one uh, location, that's important. Um, your contact information, certainly a way that they can contact you. Um, if you have links, include links um, on your capability statement. Um, here's one key and important aspect of marketing. If you, if you pre-record a kind of an elevator speech into a nice presentation, put a link to it in your capability statement. The contracting officers will look at it because they'll be able to, rather than reading your whole capability statement, just go quickly and view your presentation, which is online. And it's a uh, live, kind of a live um, uh, marketing uh, tool for you. So it's very effective. And again, put a link on your capability statement. Uh, include your company data, like uh, your financial um, stability or capacity, uh, it, number of employees. Sometimes they're looking for specific contractors and they want to know whether or not you have the manpower to perform on that contract. Um, we certainly have gone away from DUNS and we're not using DUNS anymore, which stands for Dun & Bradstreet. We're now using the unified or uh, the unique I, uh, entity ID code. So you'll need one of those. Include, make sure you include it in your capability statement with your CAGE and your NAICS code. Um, GSA schedule. If you are in the GSA schedule, it's important for you to list that because sometimes it's easier for them to award you under a GSA schedule than some other means. So again, it's important for you to, to include that past performance if you have it included in there and other unique features. You might want to add any differentiators. What sets you apart from your competition? If you have a, you know, if you're certified in any group, make sure that you add it there. Some tips to improving your capability statement. Don't do more than one page. One page, you can do forward and back in one page. Trust me, it fits in there and it looks really nice. Um, make it visibly appealing, you know, by adding pictures. Um, a link to the websites. Again, if you have a LinkedIn account or YouTube recording in there, um, please use it. Those are very effective ways to get them to um, check out further your profile or your capabilities. Um, also, use bullet tab uh, tables and highlighted sessions. That just jumps out a little bit more. Um, solicit feedback. You know, use our resource partners to look at your capability statement and tell you whether you need to improve or you know if there's something else that you need to add. And make sure that you check spell. You know, you check your spelling and your grammar. Uh, this is very important. Um, you know, again. Don't miss out on adding differentiators and the past performance because this is really key. It's important. Uh, and also use government language. If you are pursuing specific um, opportunities and you see that mostly they refer to a product in a certain way, make sure that you remember to use that. Um, key to successful meetings, you want to certainly engage the government and request a meeting. Uh, and the way when you approach him is just ask for a 15 minutes or a 30 minute presentation at the most. Usually I tell people ask for 30 minutes. 
um, usually they will give you the 30 minutes. Um, but if not, they'll probably say, well, we'll give you 20. And all you need to remember, if you have that elevator speech, is your 15 minutes. So request a meeting. Do your homework. Make sure that you understand the agency, why it buys, how it buys, uh, and what it buys. Um, give specific reasons for the meeting. You want to introduce your company and you want to um, uh, help them understand how you can help them achieve their mission. Number two, conduct a pre-meeting research. Okay, keep track of past, current, and future opportunities. If you want to land a contract with that agency, look at what they purchased in the past and how they purchased it. And when you come to the table, be prepared with that information. Um, that will help them understand how well you understand how they're buying the product for how long uh, and how you fit in the whole picture. And then post meeting. Remember, if you made promises at your meeting, keep them. Write a thank you note and ask them to share the information, okay, with other contracting officers, with other agencies. There's nothing better than word of mouth. And these contracting officers, they talk with one another. So this is a way for you to receive free marketing, um, you know, from a, a, an agency that certainly, um, you know, has your capability statement and was impressed with your uh, elevator speech or anything they found in your profile and your LinkedIn profile or YouTube. Um, it's uh, under, uh, this is a good idea for you to understand first and foremost that the government's fiscal year starts in October and ends in September. Um, that as you are developing your marketing approach to the government, that in the first quarter, um, you do you know raise awareness and build relationship. Go out there and start working. Okay, start working on building those relationships. Once you move into the second and third quarter, that's when you want to lead generate. You want to do a campaign. Um, uh, you want to do a lead generation campaign and response. That's the time. And lastly, if you are in the 8A program or one of the other program that allows you sole source, that fourth quarter is a great time for you to go and try to pursue those sole source opportunities because that last funding that they have, um, they have the last quarter to spend it. So this is a great opportunity for you to touch base with them again. Um, when you speak with the government, make sure that you remember there are some, you know, there's some uh, language that the government works, you know, make sure that, you know, you rework your message so that the government understands. Um, sometimes, you know, they're not familiar with the terminology used in the private sector. And if you're trying to incorporate a product uh, into the federal government, then, you know, sometimes it's it's better to understand what they've been using and what do they call the system and, you know, so that you can relate to them. Don't be afraid to ask questions. This is very important. Also, list any contract vehicles that you currently are performing or that if you have a GSA schedule open, make sure that you name them. Again, GSA schedule is an easy way to uh, land a contract. I know it could take a long time to get on the GSA schedule, but when you do, it's like an open contract. Um, stress contracting experience, if you haven't, and if not, we're gonna talk about how you can start building your uh, government contracting experience. And lastly, you know, make sure you proofread any messaging that you're sending to the agency. Remember, first impressions, okay, are important. How to find a decision maker. This is so important, and I'm not gonna go deep into this because again, I gave you a small business resource guide, which is a handout uh, that will be with this presentation. I'll give you an idea what that looks like, but in there, it will tell you how you can contact the small business um, specialist, how to contact the Office of Small Disadvantaged Business who can connect you to the buyers, okay? But don't be afraid to make the calls and schedule an appointment, okay? Network and contact a small business specialist. A small business specialist might hook you up with the buying or the contracting officer. So again, some key people here that you need to make sure. And lastly, don't be afraid to submit the um, proposals. You know, um, sometimes you might not win. There might be a few of them. There might be quite a few that you might not win. But you know, with every single solicitation that you respond to, you're getting experience. Also, there are some resource partners that will look at your solicitation or your um, proposal and help you with that proposal. So don't be afraid to ask for help. 
because the help is there. And we're going to talk a little bit more about helpful resources. Okay, so we want you to be the prime. But if you don't have prime contracting experience, then you could be a sub. And just quickly, you know, the prime is the contractor that will be awarded the direct contract. And a subcontractor would be the sub, the contractor that will get a piece of that contract that was awarded to the prime contractor. And oftentimes when you don't have the past performance, you can work as a subcontractor, okay? Um, also, the prime contractor controls the relationship. So if you're doing, you're working with your prime on a federal contract, um, the federal government is not going to speak to the subcontractor. They're going to speak directly to the prime contractor. So um, also prime and subcontractor need to work as uh, a cohesive and high performance team. Um, this will, again, uh, this will be reflected in the evaluations for the entire team. And if you're a subcontractor to a prime, now they're working on a system where they'll capture your performance as a subcontractor. And then the government can use that to evaluate your performance and decide whether or not they want to award you a contract as a prime. Um, planning and communication leads to more successful contracts. The better you work with your prime, the more opportunities will come your way and eventually you can become the prime. Consider subcontracting. Again, I already mentioned some of the great advantages of doing that. There are certain ways that you can do. The first thing is that by uh, finding someone or uh, doing sub work, you're going to build your capabilities. You can also work with a prime uh, through a teaming agreement. There's opportunities to join venture uh, and also take advantage of the mentor protege program where uh, mentor protege program is a business development tool used to help you uh, expand on your capabilities. So again, a lot of programs within the SBA to help you grow and land your contract with the federal government and grow your business. Um, you can, again, ways to in, increase or, or enhance your past performance is the more experience you have, the better you're going to show up in terms of, um, you know, how, how you're coming across to the federal agencies. Lastly, we're going to talk about how the government can help. And certainly there's a ton of resources. Number one, the SBA, we have business opportunity specialists on hand. We have two in this office. Uh, there's one, if you're not local here, you can contact your local SBA office and they can put you in touch with a business opportunity specialist. We also have procurement center representatives. They are SBA's main point of contact with the federal agency. So if you're looking to see who buys your product, you can reach out to a procurement center representative who can be an advocate um, for you, letting that agency know, hey, listen, this opportunity can be reserved for small business or women own or hub zone. Also, we have procurement technical assistance centers uh, throughout the country. They can help you with contracting assistance, uh, looking at your proposal, helping you improve your capability statement. Uh, they do consultation one-on-one -on -one, uh, at no cost. They also have workshops uh, and they provide a lot of information, not only to do business with the federal government, but to do business with the state and local, count, commun uh, local counties. Um, also, there are some resources here that I list here. They will be in your handout. The one that I list for you to do your market research is the Federal Procurement Database. There's also the System for Award Management, which will list active opportunities, contracting opportunities, as well as those that were recently awarded. Uh, if you want to look for another small business to team up, you can look at the Dynamic Small Business Search. Again, there will be a link for you on the website. And then there's also some helpful uh, uh, links here for USA spending, which will give you an idea, uh, total dollars that the government is spending. There's also GSA subcontracting and DOD prime contracting directly. Again, all that information is gonna be in a pamphlet that I am handing out to you that looks very much like this. It will list the resource, give you a description of what you can find there, and then it'll give you a link that you can use to directly link to the website. Um, lastly, it, again, if you're interested in doing business with GSA and becoming a GSA contractor, I encourage you to visit the GSA website. That's gsa.gov. Uh, if you become a contractor, again, it's an easy way for the government to directly award to you. 
Again, if you want to get started with doing business with the federal government, you'll need to obtain a unique entity identifier, which you can do by going to SAM, www.sam.gov. Once you're there and you apply for the UEI number, you will register and complete your registration. And once your registration becomes active or before it becomes active, you will request a cage code. All this is in the step-by-step -step process and you're not gonna miss a single step. But if you need access, you know, you could click certainly on the link down here and it will take you certainly to that link to get what you need. So get to work and submit your proposals. Again, I, I'm always telling people, look, again, it might take you several, it might take you 10, it might take you 15, it might take you two, but it's important for you to submit your um, proposals and respond to them, okay? Evaluate your pricing. Um, you know, again, make sure that you include and demonstrate your past performance. Be specific to what uh, agency you're targeting. Submit your bid and wait. And if you don't get that bid, if you don't get it awarded, request a debriefing. You can request that the agency meet with you to help you improve your next proposal by giving you some feedback on why you didn't win it. Okay, so these are all helpful tips. And that comes to the end of my presentation. I want to highlight that you can follow us at uh, in Twitter at SBA uh, DFW. We are also in Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. My specific LinkedIn is right here, so you can certainly connect with me. Uh, and I want to make sure that at least you have my contact information in case you want to get a hold of me. I'm going to leave this on uh, for just a few minutes and I'm going to turn it back to Jenny um, so that we can take on some questions. I'm pretty sure we'll have plenty of questions on the chat. So, Jenny, I'm going to turn it back to you. Nancy, I've been keeping track of notes on my phone in the chat. Yes, we have questions. Now, a couple housekeeping items before we get to that. Everybody, I want you to know that we dropped into the chat. You'll have to scroll up a little bit. Um, it says handout, and it's going to be a Dropbox link. So what you'll want to do, because I'm sure you want to hear the Q&A here, is copy that, then paste it to a separate browser so you're not copying and pasting into this. Paste it into a separate browser, and then you can print that off later. Now, the other question I have for you, Nancy, not to put you on the spot here, but people are asking if they can have the copy to the presentation. Sarah does have the ability to share that with everybody, but I wanted to make sure that was okay with you. Yeah, since it's a large presentation, I made it a PDF file, and you're more than welcome to share that with the audience. Okay, amazing. So Bob's going to do that and paste it in, because I know a couple of you were saying, okay, this is a lot, and I'm taking notes, but I still want to be able to review it. And I'll also remind you guys, the replay of the whole video will be up by, uh, by next Wednesday. So six days from now, the replay will be up, so you can get the refresher the refresher right so um so bob will post that so again two handouts are in the chat the first one if you scroll up a little bit it's the handout that nancy provided for us and then the second one is in the comments right now it's um it's another dropbox link so you can save that to your dropbox or print it off okay nancy getting a lot of really good questions thank you so much for sharing your expertise and being so generous with your time um is somebody saying listen i'm just kind of confused about the agencies that you're mentioning how do we know which agencies are? Can you give sort of like maybe the, the big couple that we need to know about? Sure, yes, and that's a great question because it can be confusing. So when I'm talking about doing business with the government, I'm talking about federal agencies like IRS. Every single agency has a list of things that they need to buy in order to maintain their operations. For example, the Navy has to buy jets and tanks and so on and so forth, right? And they get that from small businesses, oftentimes. Um, so those are the type of agencies I'm talking about. Okay, that is helpful. So we're just any kind of government agency. And when we think about that too, we think of, oh yeah, I didn't think of the, the Navy or, you know, not all of us work with government all the time. I guess it could be school districts too, right? Or School districts are at another level. They're not necessarily federal. So for example, you can't use my certifications or not mine, but SBA certifications to pursue contracts with the county unless there's some federal funding involved, 
Okay. So if they get certified, they're trying to pursue business directly with the federal government, IRS, H, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Housing and Urban Development, all those agencies, Department of Justice, <laughs> um, the Federal Procurement Database will give you a listing of all the federal agencies. Okay. The Federal Pro Procurement Database. Uh -huh. It's uh, also a link in the resource guide that I gave you. Excellent. And that is in the resource guide. So I hope that's helpful. Feel free to type in here with follow-ups, you guys. Um, and this one's not, not maybe specific to what you were talking about today, but perhaps you can speak to it because somebody's asking about it saying, um, any guidance for starting a consulting business, how you would go about uh, getting that started. And perhaps if you were looking for a small business loan. Yes, absolutely. So we have great resources. One of the things we do is access to capital. We help small businesses start uh, their business. So there is capital to start a business as well as you have one to expand. Now, how do you go about? The first thing they're going to need is a business plan key, right? Because you're going to present that business plan to the lender. SBA does not do direct lending. The only direct lending the SBA does is the disaster assistance program. The other loans, the regular startups and expansion loans are where SBA provides a guarantee. So as a small business, primarily a startup can be high risk for a banker and they might select to have SBA's backing. It's no different than like a co-signer. Co-signer helps people understand SBA's role better. Um, so we're kind of co-signing, right? We're guaranteeing to the bank a portion of that loan. Um, but you get your business plan rolling. You can visit SBA's financing tab. There's going to be a lender tool match. Click on that. It's going to do generate a quick um, questionnaire, who you are, how much money you need, and for what. And then that will go out to the lenders, and the lenders will reach out to you within two days. Okay, that is very, very helpful. Yeah, because there's a lot to navigate here. Now, when we're talking about these resources to starting and growing a business, what what are some of the biggest mistakes you see people make in the beginning and you see it maybe in an application or, you know, in some face to face meetings where you think, oh, gosh, they've got everything, but they're missing this one component. Well, you know, most often what we see is that people do not take advantage of all the free resources that are available, you know. Starting a business, or even if you have one and you're expanding, you reach a plateau and you need some ideas to continue to grow your business, you know, they don't use these resources that are free. And I'm always telling them, use these free resources at it as if they were your advisory board. What a great opportunity to pick their brain, right? And get the information that you feel you want to implement. So I would say if there's some things that, that, that they usually miss on is understanding that these free resources can be used as often as they like. They're free and they're available there for them in all areas of business. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So I like that mindset idea, you guys, where you're kind of thinking, okay, I may not have an advisory board yet, but... I'm going to use these resources as my advisory board and sort of listen to the documentation, the presentations that are out there, which is what everybody's doing here today with you too, which is, um, which is really wonderful. Now, let's say somebody applies for one of these government contracts and they go after it. They've checked their spelling. They've, you know, they've checked to make sure they're hitting all the boxes and they don't get it. Um, what's the next best step after that? So, the best thing is to grow out of that, right? That's why I said request a debriefing. They can contact the agency and the agency can sit down with them and say, this is where your proposal was weak. It could be pricing, but on the other hand, it can be experience. Okay, so there are many things, but if you don't know that, how you're going to grow to understand how you need or where you can improve. OK, so again, if it is it past performance that you're lacking and they're going to share that with you, then maybe your next time you might want to say, maybe I might want to get myself a partner, right? Another small business that I could partner with and come up as a stronger unit, you know, which we call joint ventures and the agency can award to the joint venture. 
Okay. And and then and then would would uh, would becoming a subcontractor for somebody else be considered experience in this realm or Yes, absolutely. If you do subcontracting work for a prime contractor that has a federal contract, that right there works as an experience because you worked on a on a federal contract. You just didn't do it as a prime contractor. You did it as a sub. And the prime contractor is usually reporting who his subs are. Okay. Okay. And, and now, when I'm hearing this, I'm thinking, okay, I would want to be the sub because the prime is the one filling out all the paperwork. I'm just coming in to do the work. Am I interpreting that incorrectly? Well, you know, there's some documents that you're going to have to provide to the prime contractor. Like, probably they're going to ask you to submit a proposal yourself. Um, for the type of services that they're looking because they're subcontracting a portion of the contract. And remember, your response is going to be a part of their proposal because that's the final price, right? So you're going to have to provide that. The other thing is that your prime contractor might want to get credit for subbing work to another small business, right? So you're going to have to let them know and show them that you are certified. So again, yeah, there was going to be a little bit of work, but it's certainly going to be less than having to respond to a uh, proposal as a prime contractor. Yes. Ah, understood. Okay. I was trying to take the easy way out, you know? Uh, so you guys, we have about four minutes to go. So please get your questions in. If I haven't asked it, or if we haven't answered it, get it in and let's get, you know, this is a like no bad questions at this point. You know, we really want to make sure that it's an enriching experience for you. Now, let, let's talk about if somebody's just getting started, how, is there any sort of percentage like, oh, the average business applies for, you know, two government contracts before they, after, before they actually get one, or usually you get 10% of the ones you apply for. Is there any sort of percentage like that? There's no statistical data, at least that I access, I have access to. Um, there probably is up there. The agencies might have that information or, you know, I don't personally have it. I can tell you based on my experience with some of the contractors I deal with. Of course, I, I, I have oversight over the 8A program and it's a more intimate relationship with the contractors. Um, so, you know, I'm not surprised that we have 40% of our portfolio uh, that maybe two years go by and they haven't received. But you know what? I also have seen them. Yeah. After their two years, they land their first one. And after their first one, the contracts just keep coming in and in because once you get your first one and you have some good performance under your belt, usually the agencies just want to come back to you and they talk to one another. And also you're going to be now in their system. They have a system where they document your performance, they rate you, and that rating is in there. Oh, uh, it's one of those things where you have to have experience in order to get the job, but in order to get experience, you have to get the job. It's kind of <laughs> gets funny too. So it sounds like once you once you get in, it's a little bit more uh, free flowing in terms of getting work as long as you're performing really well. Correct. And there might be instances where the agency has a need for that. Okay. And you're potentially um, the best source. So they're going to go to you even maybe if you don't have the experience. So there's so many different circumstances. I always tell everybody, it doesn't mean that just because um, you haven't done government work, you're not going to get it. I'm pretty sure um, you will find an agency that will award your contract. Okay, this is a really good question. Does the SBA have assistance to help create a great proposal? Wow. Well, that's an interesting question because prior to these past two years, we didn't have. Now we have a vendor uh, that is on board with us and they provide classes there for free. And it's everything having to do with government contracting, from writing a proposal to responding to a solicitation to doing the marketing research. They even have a system where they will include you and notify you of opportunities of interest to you and create kind of a capture management system. If they want more information than that, that's under the 7J Management and Technical Assistance Center. I put out announcements on those opportunities, training opportunities coming up uh, about every uh, every month or every every other month. Um, so have them register on our website. Go to sba.gov forward slash the word updates. And all I have to do is enter their email address and select Dallas for Word as, as the area of interest and they're gonna get my newsletter.
Oh, fabulous. Well, Nancy, that's great. You are a, truly a wealth of information. The presentation was excellent. So I just want to remind everybody, you've got the full presentation in the chat. You can copy and paste that and do that before we close out. Because once we close out, the chat's going away. Um, and then scroll up for the, the documents and the handouts. Uh, Nancy, thank you so much. It sounds like they can find you on LinkedIn if they want to reach out for more, right? They can, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. And everybody, we look forward to seeing you again next week, same time, same place. And you can get the replay on Sarah National's YouTube channel, uh, which you will find. Well, look, you just look Sarah National on YouTube. It will come up. Uh, I'm seeing somebody saying, I don't see it, but I don't know what you're meaning, Julia. Probably if you don't see it, click on the chat, whatever it is, and then scroll up and then you'll see links. It's there. There are two links in the chat and those are the two links that I'm referencing. You want to copy them and then paste them. All right. Treasure the time with all of you and I look forward to seeing you again in a week. Talk to you soon, everybody. Bye-bye.